Welcome to this episode of the Learning Without Limits podcast series for The Learning Lounge. I'm your host, Melanie Bernicle. This episode, I'm chatting with Australian music royalty. Yep, eight albums, 17 ARIA nominations. She's an award-winning songwriter and performer. She has appeared in films such as Moulin Rouge, The Matrix and Unsound, appeared in stage productions such as Rent, Rocky Horror. Like, is there anything that this woman has not done? She's got her own radio show. And yes, she's done children's entertainment and she's got a course that she runs through schools as well, teaching her culture. Now, who are we chatting with today? I'm chatting with the amazingly talented and wonderful human being, Christine Anu. Thanks, Christine, for joining me. Oh my God, it's absolutely amazing. But I'd like to start, Mel, if I may, firstly, by paying my respects to elders um, and acknowledging um, elders past, present and emerging and pay my respects to being on and acknowledging the land that we're on today. I love that. It's a very nice way to start our interview, as it should be. <laughs> awesome. Um, Christine, can we start back? Because I know so many amazing things that you've done, but I'd love to like just go straight back to sort of your childhood and talk about like where you grew up and, you know, was singing a part of, you know, your family life growing up. And tell me a bit about that childhood experience for you. Yeah. So I put on green today um, as to pay homage to my island heritage, my Torres Strait Island heritage. I grew up, my early years, I grew up in Brisbane. And around about when I was about 10, uh, my grandfather passed away. He came to stay with us for a little bit in Brisbane. He passed away and it was a massive loss for the community. I remember I was quite young, but I was old enough to know the, the kind of loss that the family felt, but the community felt um, as a whole. And shortly after that, my parents decided to shut shop and pull up the camp and take all of us kids and head follow the sun north um, into past Cairns, past the tip of Australia into the Torres Strait Islands. So we went back into pretty sort of primi primitive um, way of living. And as far as singing goes, you really quickly s learn that singing is a very big part of cultural way of living. Fast forward, I'm, I've finished high school and I've decided to join uh, a dance college in Sydney, in Glebe. Uh, so that's how then you've moved and transitioned from the yeah. islands. So you've just packed up and just jumped on a bus. Uh, well, we had to go to boarding school first. Ah, so we okay. leave the island to yep. attend boarding school. Yes. Were you dancing at the time? No, no, I wasn't dancing at all. I'm a, I'm a late bloomer in every sense of the word. So my first year was 1988. It was the year of the bicentenary yes. in Australia. There were there were protests, marches happening all over in every capital city. Yeah all over Australia. And see, when it comes to, um, you know, protest marches and social commentary and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders really sort of being out there and being activists, I'd only ever seen that on the news, mm. on television, in the safety and comfort of my, of my home with my parents. In my first year at the dance college, they pulled us out of classrooms and we would be involved in these marches wow. and not only that the dances that we'd be learning in the classrooms because we were learning aboriginal and torres strait islander songs and dances yeah and we'd be taking it out of that that sort of classroom environment and, and we'd be in the streets uh where the rallies were happening yeah and so if when we weren't marching we were dancing in the streets wow um of sydney at the time and so it was really an interesting time for uh, you know i would have been 17 18 going on 18 an amazing time for the, for your brain to be formulating yeah. itself and finding your social voice in in all of that so there was plenty of opportunities to perform yeah and become a really quite i don't know different special type of dancer yeah i think as well having that nice understanding what you were saying we from going from watching something on the tv to physically being there and I think whenever you're involved in something it changes and shifts something in you and when you feel like you're even more a part of something when you are involved and by being able to express those things through dance and through the love of all of that what a nice way to sort of 
bring your culture into the forefront of, mm-hmm. you know, what needs to be seen in Australia? I find it so different now because my daughter's generation is the hashtag movement. You know, they, <laughs> yeah. they voice their opinion mm. um, from behind a screen. You know, and and that's how they seem to be following a movement. Yes. Whereas my generation was very much in the streets, mm. on the ground, being involved, yes. showing up physically, and saying, "I stand for this, mm. and I stand I stand for that." So, very very different time to then to yeah. now, and seeing the world through my daughter's eyes is a very interesting way of of looking at that as well. Because I started her off dancing when she was a little one. Yeah. So she's kind of following in the parallels of, of my life as well. Yeah. Um, in that regard. But and I've heard her sing. And, and she sings. And she <laughs> and sings she as sings. well. It's um, I don't know. For me personally, like when I remember sort of growing up, I think like Zippy's age and their generation, I think people feel that they have a voice from a young age. For me, growing up. Like I was a kid in the 70s. But for me growing up, I feel sometimes that I felt like I personally didn't have a voice just maybe even as a woman, not even someone like yourself who, you know, is Indigenous Australian. So it's I just found like it wasn't until a certain point in my life I was like, actually, I have a voice. Um, And I sort of had been told, well, you're a woman, you don't have a place or things like that. And I think what is beautiful about the youth of today is that they 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 feel that they do have a voice, even if it is behind a screen, but they do feel that they're entitled to share their voice. And it took me a long time for me personally to sort of find that I was allowed to do that. Um, and I, I, I think it's different for everybody, but I think there's something beautiful about today's age where most people from that young age, and that teaches me well, if, that they can have a voice and, you know, you've got a few years behind you, well, then it's okay to sort of stand up and, and speak, whereas I think I used to hide behind things. Well, things like the hashtag Me Too movement really did uh, set a precedent for women's voices to be heard and yes. that um, it it matters what, what women have to say, but that things have happened and that yeah. we have had a culture for way too long that has suppressed what happens to women mm. and that the, the truth behind it is that just because we see the world through a man's eyes, uh, it doesn't mean that that is the right way that things need to be conduct, conducted. And I mm. think with the next generation of women coming through, the way that we write scripts, the way that we will yes. see stories being told back to mm. us will be all inclusive as well. Yeah, I think, you know, your career has sort of seen you sort of do so many different things in the music or in the entertainment industry because you cover pretty much all of it. <laughs> Do you, have you seen like a massive change from how, you know, you might have been treated in the beginning to how you're treated now, whether it be as a woman or? It's, it's a very interesting one because I always ask, I'm asked, like just recently asked, what is, what is my reconciliation Mm. Australia journey look like for me? What does reconciliation in Australia look like for me? That's a great question. I was 21, 22 when I was starting out in an industry that, I mean, it's very hard to make it in the music industry in Australia, Mm -hmm. let alone being young and a black woman. And it was was hard because I I had to push always against um, the majority of males in, who were making, who were decision makers Mm. in my circle. The pushback would always be, but, you know, you don't need to worry about that. But I do need to worry about that because it, this is my presentation. This is, this, I am my product. I'm the one getting out of bed. The voice belongs to me. It's inside my body. I have to make those decisions. You know, if you allow people to make those decisions for you from the very beginning of your career, it will stay that way. Yeah. But I, I think I came, because I had that support from the outset, and that I was coming from a place of, you know what, my cult- I have to lean on my culture. I can't make a lot of decisions be- that, are- that might be adverse to what my- my- the people in my community feel and think. Mm. Um, 
and because I had re proper representation saying, you know, this, we can't do things that will offend yeah. people in my culture, uh, there was that respect. And thank God I had, you know, people like Michael Gadinsky at the helm yep. in Mushroom Records that had people looking after the label that said, yes, we have to, we have to make sure that this, the voice of, of Indigenous Australians are supported. And I felt that I had that from the beginning. Wow, what a really nice place to be, like especially in the music industry because just even whether you're a black woman or just a woman in general, most people, they put them into a pop star copy card, you know, to get them going. And what they were embracing was your culture and your own identity. And you know, I think that also is a testament to your the inner strength of you and working with them, the fact that people cared because you care. Well, and I love the fact that Australia was still in a place where, where the music industry was trying to find what Australia's music industry sounds like. Yeah. What does Australia's music sound like? Yeah. And I am very fortunate to have come in at a time when Gadinsky wanted to get artists on board that lent to what that music soundscape would be like. Yeah. So I was given the opportunity to put my own language into music and that. and be myself. Yes. So, you know, kudos to Mushroom Records for, for that yeah. opportunity. Yeah, amazing. I love I like hearing those stories because there's so many different things you hear about the entertainment industry when you hear something that's really lovely like that and then you get to cement yourself, you know, and that's what, you know, we've known you for as well as part of the Australian music culture. And you really do, whether you're singing in your native language or, you know, the, the other songs that, you know, everyone knows. And it's, and it's done in a way too that it's, 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 a, it's my native language, but it's, it's Australia's, this is Australia's cultural heritage. Yes. It, it, I'm, it might belong to me, but I'm sharing it. And that's, this is what the beauty of music is and, and the thing that I find is my great privilege and honour is that I have a place, a job that I respect and that I take seriously in order for it to be, I don't know, it, it's, an, it's a place to educate people. Yeah. I, I, I love the opportunity to be able to gift it to yes. Australia. Yeah, you know. when you sing in your native language, I was having a chat to the producer before you came in, and I always cried just talking the day that I, when you and Zippy were singing together, and it was I think for the for the football, and you were doing we were, um, had the opera house in the background, and then you guys were singing. I'm standing up the back crying. And there's something about when you sing in your native language that just shifts something on the inside, and I can't even explain it. It's just it's magical, and I think every time you do it, I cry, and I'm just like the emotional Piscean went to. You know, I don't know, there's something really beautiful about it. And I Thank just, too. yeah, it's something that really moves me on a personal level. And I just, yeah. See, and that's, that's the other thing I get with, in singing language, it's, it's so special to be able to have my daughter mm. and share the extension of that. Cause we, we're not, we don't speak our language as a first language, yeah. unfortunately. But my daughter and I go absolutely out of our way. Well, we've got mum still here to yes. learn our language. We, yeah. It's something that we, we do over the phone regularly. Um, but when she was living, still at home, Sunday, all day, language day, you oh. know. And the opportunity to sing in language is just oh, it's so delightful. I mm. cherish it. I look forward to it. Now, when you're talking about educating through language as well you have an education piece that you teach through schools does yep. that is that something that is part of that course that you created and that you run through the education platform yeah it's so fun it's um, i look i when i went to this dance school yeah yes it was learning dance and all types of dance so we learned aboriginal and torres strait islander traditional cultural dances yes but we also learned tap ballet contemporary jazz uh, modern um, and folk dancing. Um, oh. We had um, uh, Margaret Walker, who has passed, but she was Australia's leading folk dance teacher at our school, teaching us folk dances. And 
we would we would have international stars come in, international guests come in to teach dancers from Japan, dan wow. and uh, Native American uh, guests would come in, and this would be a constant exchange um, year in, year out. And then during May, we would have this thing called the workshop, and the com we'd open up our doors so that people in the community who were either subscribers to the school yep. or friends of would be invited to see what we were doing. So we would put on a performance of cultural dances and what have you. Um, so over this five years, we learnt, I learnt so, 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 so much. But this, it, in, within that, I also became uh, the, the, graduate, the graduation, you get a diploma, an associate diploma in teaching. So right. the last three years of the five years, you are actual training as a teacher. So I came out of that and I never used my teaching qualifications mm. to, to, teach, um, to teach dance. So I decided to, as, as Christine Anu, the singer, take uh, a package selling myself as the singer but, prov but giving them oh so much more, more yeah. once they've had me for that hour on stage. Wow. I've come away from schools where the principal and the school teachers or um, the department that's organised bringing me into the school mm. have said, we weren't expecting what you brought in, but that's ticked so many boxes uh, wow. for, for things that we, we need covered for, for the year. So, yes, so I teach cultural language yes. and then I demonstrate it through song and dance. Oh, how beautiful. So I teach them phrases yes. like I'll say, Kapu batenga, good morning. I'm going to teach you how to say that as well. Please. Kapu batenga, good morning. So I'll teach them what morning is. I'll teach them what afternoon is, good or good evening, kubil. So doing the performances is fantastic. I bring all of my knowledge from the dance teaching training that I had and I haven't used it in 20 odd years, you know. Um, so being able to put that into a, a one hour show has been absolutely amazing. So I'll go into them and go into the, the first thing that I'll do when I look out at the crowd is wave to them. And then I'll say, Kapu Bataya, Muzunel Christine Anu, Ngai Kai Perform Me Pangibepa, Ina Raymond, Nui Dungai Pa Gita Matampa Cave. So I tell them, I'm Christine Anu. Good morning, I'm Christine Anu. Um, I'm going to be performing for you today with my guitarist, Raymond. Um, and then I go on to tell them, show them morning, noon, night and g'day. Yes. I'm going to be teaching you that. Yes. <laughs> um, and then once I've taught them the phrase, I'll give them, you know, multiple, you know, I'll ask them questions like, so if it was morning, how would you say good morning? And then they, they teach it back to me. So there's, it's very interactive. I love that. And then I'll teach them a song yes. in Torres Strait language and then uh, show them videos of traditional dancing, uh, show them videos of myself in my career. Um, and then we, we, we have a great big, lovely, lovely time learning them cultural songs and dances. By this point, they don't think I'm going to sing for them. The teachers are like, oh, when are we going to hear my island home? <laughs> And so I, I, and then obviously at the end, I, I put on a, a short performance for them and um, it, you know, it's really, really, really wonderful. And by the end, they'll be able to say, good morning, how are you? My name is, and they'll tell me their name uh, and then they'll know how to say thank you, eso, and um, kapu yao, yep. bye, goodbye. How, what a beautiful thing to be able to walk away, to be inspired by your career, but then also to, to bring on board that cultural aspect that they can learn and well yeah they get a lot more aboriginal cultural education yes. because we are living on the mainland of australia there is very rare an opportunity to have a torres strait islander come into your school in new south wales but mm -hmm. predominantly uh, queensland yes because that's where the torres strait islands are um but it's really wonderful to be able to go into schools and for them to say, we don't get a lot of Torres Strait Island information mm. and it's great that you can come in and do that. Um, and and I'll say, yep, tick, on to yeah. the next. But it is. I, it, it's very rare for them to be able to sort of concentrate on Torres Strait Islander mm. um, uh, 
culture yes. because there's very, few, you know, very limited educational things out there. Mm. Christine, within your own native language, which language, I was doing a bit of research and I, there's two kind of main languages and then there's like obviously many dialects. Yes. Um, what's the name of the language that you speak? Okay, so the language that I speak is Kalau, Kawaoya, that's my mum. Yes. And dad's language, which is, I think, what we picked up because we lived on dad's island when we when I was um, uh, nine, ten, is Kalalagoya. So there aren't any dialects. There's just a variation in in the in the different islands. Okay. So the language changes in different islands. Ah, I see. So my dad's is Kalalagoya, Kalalkawaoya. Yes. Then you have the Central Torres Strait, which has its own language, and then the Eastern Torres Strait, which is where Eddie Marbo came yes. from. Yes. Okay. So the Eastern Torres Strait is Miriam Mir. Okay. Yeah. So did the language vary quite a lot, do you find, like when you're listening to the different languages? So on top of that, we have Yumpla Tok, yes. which was a very new language that was created around about pearling boom in the Torres Strait because there was English speaking people, Melanesian speaking people, mm -hmm. um, there were Japanese, Chinese, uh, Malay, um, Timorese. So there were so many different cultures that there needed to be a common language created. Wow. Um, and it was Yumpla Tok. So by the time I was four, I was speaking English, Yumpla Tok, Kalalagoya, Kalakawaya. Wow. Well. So four languages. By, and the, they, they vary in that um, there are certain consonants. Um, this, there might be a similarity in in say the name for island, yes, um, but it might change in uh, in other words. But strangely enough, the islands being so close together, they understand each other when yeah. they talk. Um, but it's very, very different in the Eastern Torres Strait, a completely different language altogether. Yes, and Yumpla talk because everyone speaks it. It's based uh, loosely around um, Pislama from Solomon Islands. Yes, that their language. And which is called Pislama and English. Okay. So it's got a lot of English words in there. Yeah. Um, and Pislama. And it's very similar to Papua New Guinean Pisin. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so because when I was doing some research on it, like it was sort of there was like the two distinct variations, but then just to hear and explain that, it just, it makes sense. It's just, <laughs> it's nice to sort of hear like from you, you know, how it changes. But, you know, the lovely thing is that I will go throughout places in Queensland and even the Northern Territory where Aboriginal English has seeped into the community and to the way that, that um, it, you know, the, I guess Australians speak within that local area. So, That's you know, how we talk about accents. Yes. And... But this is, we're, we're talking about how lingo, yes. uh, colloquialisms and, and things like that have seeped into the way that people in the local area speak. Like I know I have friends who are Australian yep. um, in, who, who live in Darwin who say mob mm. and, you know, us mob and you mob. And that's an Aboriginal language thing that's seeped into the community. That's a great example. Yes. Um, Deadly apparently is something that was a colloquial from the 70s. It was like a hipster thing, but it stayed in Aboriginal language and it's sort of become something that is spoken, you know, used a mm. lot more in colloquial um, slang in Australia. Yeah. Now. It, yeah, definitely. Well, in, a, in Aboriginal English, mainly. Mm. When you say something's deadly, it means, yeah, that's good. Yes, because they've got the Deadly Awards. They've got so many different things yeah, so with we, that at the front. Yeah, exactly. We, we've become a lot more used to hearing it yes. um, as something that's like cool as opposed to venomous, toxic yes. and may kill you. Because when you think of Australia and you think of mainland, you're thinking of deadly snakes, 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 spiders, all the other things which I'm terrified of. <laughs> no, but if I was going to say you look deadly, you'd, you'd say that was a compliment. Yes. You look yeah. deadly today. It's like, oh, awesome. pass this. <laughs> And then when you say cis in your language as well, because you do hear it um, when you're watching films and your things, what does that mean in, oh, in that? It's absolutely a term of endearment. Yes. Um, it's like, you know, 
it's like um, brother. Yes. In, in our language, we say bala. Okay. But um, sis or sissy is um, it's a real term of endearment. It's uh, it's like saying uh, you know I get you. You're you're cool. It's it's an acceptance thing. Oh, yeah, that's absolutely. really lovely. Yes. Oh, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> but um, we're not besties right away. But you know, it's like yes. saying I, I accept you. You're you're um you're, you're really cool. You. You you get us, yeah. You, you okay. get us, yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of breaking that boundary. It's it like is. we've it's taken that step barriers. to. Oh, I like that breaking the barriers. Yes. Um, talking about that, we had a conversation just the other day, um, and it was to do with music and food. And if for anyone that doesn't know, Christine is a fantastic cook. <laughs> she always brings amazing treats to set. Always, yeah. Um, this is kind of, you know. It's amazing. She made me this zucchini slice once, which had nothing I was allergic to in it, and it was the best thing I've ever eaten. Oh, yeah. I've still never you. forgotten that. I've never <laughs> forgotten it. She looks after all my allergies. I hope um, it wasn't store-bought. <laughs> no, no, no. You'd handmade this one because you'd made the sauce and you did this, and it was, like, one of my favourite things. I tried to replicate it. Let's just add it into a very good job. Oh, um, but we're talking about food, music, and one of the things that you love was connecting people. And the, that connectedness and the connectiveness and everything that we're sort of talking about is that you're connecting your language with other people and sharing that. And then there's something to do with the food and the way you share the music. And what is it about connectedness to country and connectedness with people that really like it has so much importance for you? Like, what does it do for you? Or I, I 100% feel as though like food and the endorphins and, and the chemical reactions that that food gives you just just based on pure basic nourishment yeah you know um music how it evokes emotions right yep. i mean i can be so moved by music to tears music has that ability to to do that um um, I, I don't know, maybe not so much food. <laughs> I mean, I can, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, people, music and, and words mm. and, and when they, when you combine that together can have the most powerful effect on, on somebody. And then you do that, th then you, then you put that into the equation of a gathering of people, you know, selected or non-selective, um, and then you add the equation of food. Now, food has an aroma. It's the smells. It's the sight. It's the way that people all of a sudden start gelling with each other. You know, that sort of the way that they start to feel food makes you feel comfortable and the way that you start relating to the next person. It, it, it changes the way that you loosen up, you know, it's mm -hmm. that, you know loose, loosens up your language. It loosens up, up the air in which, yeah. you know. Music, food, and company. When that all, when that, when you get that chemistry right, it is, it is so magic mm. that you just kind of want to keep producing that all the time. <laughs> yep. Which is why places like Lazotte's in Newcastle, um, in Lambton, work so well because Brian Lazotte is such a great cook, and then he manages to bring, you know, his background of music together in this great venue with great food. Uh, great artists and and th that repetition just keeps you know working really fantastically now if I could do that I would absolutely do that um, but I, I love the magic of I love the chemical basic chemical reaction of how all those things go together mm. yeah yeah I think if the if you gave me somebody they really disliked and put them in that situation and if it was the right type of food the right atmos, the right music, I probably would, it would turn, it would turn you around from, mm. you know, not liking a person too much to possibly going, you know what, I think I can find something about you <laughs> yeah. and maybe something about you that I can find that I like. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's when people sort of let go and release that it, exterior. It evokes great conversation yeah. and, you know, and, and, and it really leaves a really great spirit in the mm. room. That's a really nice way to put it that energy and that spirit and it's true because when you feel something and 
it, like for me, I love eating, but <laughs> and but hearing the music, there's something freeing, yeah. and it's an internal. It is like a chemical reaction on the inside, but there's something about you that just lets go a little. And yeah. I think you know we all tend to put walls up at different points and things. So if you you did have that person in the room with you, yeah. and you're pulling away your own barriers that you put up to protect yourself then people get a little glimpse into that vulnerability and that emotion and there's something so beautiful in that well conversation is sharing of stories isn't it really it's an exchange of stories and when you um when you are sharing food you it's it's such a communal thing Mm. you're you're sharing food and with conversation you're sharing that as well it just works it works such a wonderful wonderful magic and I think when I think about how early in my life that registered it it, I try to replicate that when I'm on stage I know that it may not have food involved in it but there is this thing about the sense of drawing a picture with your words transporting the listener to a pre- a story, a pre-told story, setting the precedence for the song that's about to follow. There's something quite magical about taking somebody on that journey. Mm. I, I I love setting up. You know, my, my daughter always makes fun of me and my band as well. It's <laughs> like, how how many songs are going to be in the set list tonight? Well, it depends on how much Christine's going to talk. <laughs> because it's and I and I I think well you know. Take the piss all you want, but it's it's really a, a good song is even better when you can put set the right tone for it. Yeah. With a great story. And I think, you know, the way you do that is really quite magical because you do bring people in, you allow them that that chance where sometimes when you just it's just that song after song and but when you do have that conversation, what a beautiful time to actually open up and share on that. You know, on a in a different level and then people have that understanding and then they're there with you on that journey but I think I don't think many people can do that I think it's a skill that you have and there's something every when you move and it's just a natural thing like your arms move and you tell this story and you literally just want to like walk up to the yeah. stage and just sit on the stage and just be right there with you because you know, it's magical I I think I you know thank you Mel and it always takes me back to that little girl who thought I wonder I you know what maybe I can sing mm. um when dad used to make us <laughs> sit around on a hot summer's night in Brisbane um and as well as you know watching young talent time and and then eventually going, you know what, when I grow up, I want to be a singer. But then not knowing how that would happen. Yeah. And then finding singing accidentally through the dancing side. Mm. I think all of these, uh, they're not, I don't think they're accidents in, in, in any way, shape or form. I think that my life was supposed to follow these really wonderful um, twists and turns that I would need to have my foundation in dancing Mm. to go into the singing uh, to fault then for that to allow me to find my my way onto into musical theater and on stage in rent yes being like a kid in a candy store finding that very musical to showcase myself as a Mm. singer and a dancer was the best time for me i was what i was about 27 Wow. 28 when I had got, uh, landed that role. So I remember that. I get to that role and that's when I realised, you know, I don't think anything happened by chance. I think I was meant to find the dancing before the singing. Mm. And then the storytelling, it, you know, I was always afraid to be on stage as a singer because I didn't know how to bridge that distance between the microphone, the band, the words, the music and then gauging the audience. I was on stage with Neil Murray and Paul Kelly and just listening to their banter, I think I had two of the best Mm. teachers in learning how to, I guess, engage with an audience, how how to connect with an audience. I think I had, with your stories, Mm. I think I had the best teachers through observing how these two men, and you know, watching Archie Roach do it, I know it's, it seems like there are a lot of men, but it is. A, a, a lot of men 
seemed to be in prime positions in the music industry in yeah. Australia. And it's through these men that I, you know, happened to get the opportunity to learn mm. and uh, learn my skill, yeah. the art of being on stage. Yeah. And how did, like, from when you were saying that, you know, it was, you know, daunting in the beginning how to do that and you were watching, how did you then piece it all together? Like, was it just step by step and because some people talk about nerves. Was it nerves or was it just trying to how does the puzzle come together to do well, I was, that? Yeah, it's interesting because what, what, are, what are nerves based on? Mm. Why, why do we get nervous about something? And it really comes down to how prepared we are. Mm. You know, um, any athlete will tell you that, anybody who is a professional at, in anything that they do in their life will tell you that nerves come from not having, not being properly prepared for what you're about to do. And for a long time, I really didn't feel like I had earned my place as a singer on stage. I hadn't had singing lessons the way that I'd gone into five years of studying dance. Mm. I hadn't lent that amount of time to being this singer. I felt that I was a fl you know, being, I was fluking my way into it. You know, I was in a situation of fully fake it till you make it. And so there, I had found my feet as a dancer, mm. but I couldn't get the words as a singer. Yeah. You know, so it was really, that that's where the nervous, ill-prepared feelings would come from. Mm. So I was afraid of my own voice. I was afraid of the words that would float on the sound of that voice. What are the strength of the words? Where would this, where's the strength of the words? Where would, where would I find them? Where were they going to come from? And then I looked at, around me at all of this wonderful life that I immersed myself in for the past five years, being in the marches and the rallies, mm -hmm. listening to such strong activists in the community, being immersed and being able to be around them in the community at, at all of these times, I started to see how I'd accumulated such an am and amassed such an amazing life mm. of experiences that the words were there. I just needed to give them ignition. Yeah. I needed to set them alight. I needed to find the fire in my own belly as a singer. And, and that would come eventually. You know, yeah. as and I guess that was when motherhood happened, and then I realised that I was the sole person in this one little person's universe. Imagine that. Imagine a little baby going, "I rely on you for everything in my life, to change them, to bathe them, to protect them, to provide for them." That role. Scary. I'm. I'm your mum. I'm your universe, mm. and and that person needs to be become a warrior, and I needed to find those warriors in my life that have been giants that have allowed to open doors for me to even be doing what I'm doing, and to have the you know privilege of being this person's mother. It changed my whole way of thinking. Um, based on that alone, I realised that being Quiam's mum, I had to find my voice. And that that voice, when I found it, would mean that he would be able to be the best version of who he is and so that I could be the best version of who I am Yeah. based on all of that. Nice. <laughs> nice to hear. Just, oh, such an emotional Piscean. <laughs> Okay, but what a beautiful gift that you find in your own strength by giving your strength to somebody else to support them. It's amazing because, well, at this point I wasn't expecting that I would be a single mum, mm. but I think that's, you know, I, I, became, I became like a, I became like a fierce warrior. I, I, stood, I stood for everything and, and no bullshit. No, I, I really did. I felt when there were, I, fe I felt when there was, you know, a, li a little bit of, sh I'd feel when 
there was chauvinistic attitudes around me mm. and I'd speak against it and I'd, I'd, I would have, the, I'd say to people, I'm going, I, I want to, I'd call a, a, a meeting and I'd say, I realise that I'm predominantly working with men, mm. but this is how I want, I want it to work for me. And I got known for that, but I also built m my group of, you know, my family yeah. of, of who I'd work with. And I'd hold on to that family because mm. before we were teaching cultural protocol to organisations that we do now, yes. I was doing it long before that that has become a thing now. I was holding on to non-Indigenous, you know, um, employees for long enough because they, they had learnt about my culture and mm. learned about our ways and I wanted to hold on to that as much as I could. And that would mean that by default my son would be protected by, you know, by people that I was working with yeah. because they would know the rights and wrongs mm. of what to do for my child, children. Wow. I think that's that strength that you've shown through that and just be able to create that environment, it's just it's so empowering for you, your children, to be able to grow up where someone's created that safe space for them. And that doesn't happen for everyone all the time. But the fact that, you know, you do that once, they remember that, that gets passed down. And then so many things in the future come because you found your voice in that moment. Absolutely. You know, I think that before children, I, I don't think I would have fussed too much yeah. about Hey, I don't stand for this, or I wouldn't. I wouldn't have stood up for myself like the way I do. But I always say to my kids, I never. I never found my voice until much later. Mm. You know, when I felt that, that things weren't right. Yeah. I never spoke up for myself. But as soon as I had my children, and I, and I spoke up because it's a world that they. I would need to leave a world for them, a legacy for them, a world that they'd have to inherit. What does it look like? It means it looks like this. Stick up for yourself. Yeah. Stand up for yourself. If you see that something's right, if you see a woman is not being treated right, mm. if you see, uh, if you see that some someone is be, somebody's being racist to you, speak up. Yeah. And also, do not stand for bullying yeah. anywhere. Yeah. Oh. Amazing. <laughs> so, 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 so I met your kids. They're awesome humans. Yeah, They're and, awesome and, humans. And, also, <laughs> and respect the elderly. Yeah. Give the elderly time, you know. Yeah. I and my kids are wonderful with my mum. Yeah. You know, the first thing that they that that they do when we go home for Christmas to see my mum when we do, is a good whole couple of days with grandma before they go off and you know knocking around with their cousins. You know? Yeah. Uh, and because they're cousins who live locally, you know, n not because not out of choice, but you know, you, you take what you have around you for granted. And they don't, they, because they see grandma all the time. So, yeah. you know, they don't, it's not as important to them. But, yeah. you know. So Whereas your my, kids are like. Yeah. Uh, my kids are like, you know, get on the ground, <laughs> ground them out for a couple of days. Awesome. She gets sick of them anyway after a couple of days. So. <laughs> <laughs> They're always like, yeah, yeah, I'm ready for my afternoon nap. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Didn't you just get up? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think that elderly have so many stories that we learn from. And, you know, and they're so willing to tell them. Yeah, they they just they just want company, mm. you know. And I think that they they yeah. don't, you know, with dad having passed away, mum doesn't have her regular, you know, <laughs> yeah. even though they used to quarrel every five minutes. Um, but that's that they were companions. Yes, and she had that. Yes. They would they would get up and have their morning uh, cup of tea, their breakfast, and then they'd have their ten o'clock card game. Love you know, it. And then that would go into, you know, lunch or whatever it would be, you know, doctor's appointments and what have you. Yeah. Um, but they, they, do, they do love a bit of opportunity to catch up and out come the stories. Oh. They've got so many stories to tell. And as time goes on, there are more stories to tell. Mm. But you know what? We're so busy with our lives that we, for we are forgetting to sit down and listen to the old ones. Mm. They're a living library. Mm. And my kids are aware of this. They're a living, living library. Once they're gone, the library's gone. Yeah. 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 I think one thing coming out of COVID that was a real blessing 
It's just slowing down and having the time for these conversations without going, oh, well, got to go, I've got to be here. I was chatting to my grand, well, we chat all the time, yeah. but we were having conversations at least every second day, if not every day. Sometimes it's the same story and other times it's different stories. I still love it all the same and I would never, you know, want to rush. But when you've got work or you're doing something, it's kind of like, okay, well, I've got this window or I've got that. And just not having to rush and even catching up with one person, it's that quality time. Mm. And that real one-on-one where you can share a story or... And it's with the elderly, I find the quality yeah. time is there. My, my kids will come away saying, hands down, that it is it is a good laugh. It is an assured <laughs> belly laugh. And they are absolutely 100% certain that grandma has probably told them a thing or two that she probably wouldn't have shared with the other grandchildren, you know. Yeah. They, they probably get, you know... Yeah, um, and shared things with us that they, that she hasn't necessarily told us before either. Mm. So there's always that sort of generational skip, where they, they've got such a beautiful relationship compared yeah. to the to the ones that um, you know that they have with the their parents, us. You know? Well, I think as parents, not that I am one, but from what I see, is that they need to be the disciplinarian, to, to create that environment, whereas the grandparents have been there and done that and they're just a bit more like it all works out in the end, <laughs> you know, and they're happy to throw the cheeky stories in and, it you know, that's a, it's a, it's a more of a freeing relationship, whereas as a parent, you you know, I just, with my parents, it's still, that's I don't think that parental relationship ever dies because, you know, it's that looking, up, you know, it's that dimension of what it is, yeah. but with the grandparent it's this sense of freedom in the conversation and there's a bit like oh, you'll be right I won't tell <laughs> I, I, I find my I find my parents are so much more accepting of the world and how it's changed maybe not like that for a lot of people in their generation but for my parents a lot more accepting of the way that the world is that my that their grandchildren live in mm. compared to how it would have been oh you know for when we were growing up <laughs> like what are you listening to that for <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> you know it was you know don't get up you you know if you go out and you don't do drugs and don't do alcohol but they're so much more forgiving with the kids mm. vaping and you know um you know the the pronouns and, and yes. you know, same-sex marriage and how the world is for our children now, mm. they're so much more, I find, accommodating yep. um, and accepting of the change in the world yes. than, than the world that we live, that they had to bring us up in. Yeah. Well, I think in today's world, acceptance is probably my favourite word and it's accepting yourself for who you are and where you are, accepting other people, other cultures, other sex. Like we can all be who we are mm. as individuals with our own uniqueness and our own special qualities and that the world is you don't have to be one shape or form mm. or look a particular way or be a certain way. The variation is what's beautiful and I think that, that word acceptance in today's day and age, you know, and I think obviously there's going to be barriers to break down and break down over time, but there is so much more of it. Mm. And, you know, I just hope that that just keeps, you know, pushing out and growing and that Absolutely. families look differently. You know, it doesn't have to be this stereotype from 1952, you know, yeah. and that growth and evolution will keep happening and the acceptance around that will keep growing. That's like my greatest wish. It's my Absolutely. favourite word. Absolutely. My mum, my mum would always say, oh, yeah, you know, I'd listen to my, you know, my daughter Zippy to explain to her, to Zippora Senior, how things are. And, oh, yeah. Which means, which translates to, that's up to them, which translates to, you do you. Wow. You know, like, it's like, Oh yeah, you do you, and and my my daughter always say, and I we always say that to each other. Yeah, you do you, mum, and I always go, baby, you do you, <laughs> baby, you do you, and and it's I think it is about there being no wrong and right way mm. of things, and and I think uh, earlier my earlier years of um, being raised in the Torres Strait, it's very very sort of 
they would would have been coming off the back of very strict uh, church kind mm. of um, way of life. Yes, you know, because uh, the influence was quite the large. influence was quite he- it's quite heavy. It's yes. heavily um, Christian in the Torres Strait, um, and it, it it is heavily about um, what what the the Bible says that there you know it's things are a certain way and um, you know. Being gay is frowned upon, yet there are so many gay people in my family, you know. Yeah. Um, I was raised by gay people. My children, uh, wh- whose extensive extended family are my gay friends who are their, you know, godparents, mm. you know. I was raised in the gay community and, you know, it's, it's quite different to having been brought up in the early years of being so strict in the Torres Strait about how, Mm. things were things were really quite you know we do care what other people think thank you very much yes and mind your p's and q's and yes um it was and yet i find myself my i've never taken the kids to church (laughs) which is very (laughs) different opposite to my upbringing yeah um but i did still uh, teach them manners you've got to have manners if i can say that there's anything wrong about this generation is Where's your manners? Yeah, and I think that that also comes from that respect. And sometimes, you know, when you've got respect for people, you are you're mindful and you you do have manners and it's kindness. And I think Kind. sometimes when people just they've got I've got this, I've got the right to do this, and I've got this, but it doesn't cost nothing to be kind. Yeah, <laughs> but you don't have to be rude about it. No, yeah. never, <laughs> never, I, never, I get, never. I get you, you're doing you, but you don't have to be rude about yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> I want to sort of go into, I was saying to earlier, you you are not just a triple threat at all. You are literally like, I don't even know, I can't even put a number on it. I think the it. older I get, the triple has probably gone down to a double, maybe. <laughs> no, no, no. Like you sing, dance, actress, radio host, and then you've done children's entertainment, theatre performer, like in the entertainment world, there's not many people that can do everything and you do it all and extremely, extremely well. Like is there, at, obviously at different moments there's been different things that, you know, like Rent or The Matrix or Moulin Rouge and then is there a particular moment that you just sort of sat back and just went, yeah, this is absolutely brilliant, like I've ticked the boxes or like where do you see to be really honest, yeah, I still don't think that all of those things is enough. I still think that the next, the oh. next great thing is probably still to come. I still think that I'm in the early stages of of still quite a, a big, wondrous, you know, career yeah. of of wonderful things, because of the pandemic and the way that we view entertainment and can do entertainment has changed the scope of things. Mm. I think it's still opened up a whole lot of, uh, you know, a plethora of things that we could still um, get involved in. All right, Christine, let's go. <clears throat> Your favourite song to perform? My Island Home. <laughs> <laughs> it's my favourite song to hear. Favourite song of all time? I Want to Dance with Somebody. <gasps> Who is one of your favourite performers of all time? Cindy Lauper. Ooh. I like that. Favourite book of all time? To Kill a Mockingbird. Ooh, nice answer. Favourite quote or mantra? I used it today. You do you. Oh, I love it. (laughs) Best advice you've ever been given and by whom? Something really impressionable. It was was basically, it was about the fear of singing My Island Home. That, you know, songs, they come from out there. And they, they come through you and they belong out there again. So stories exist out there and then they come through you and they belong out there again. It allowed me to take something that I felt belonged to people and make it theirs again. Yeah. I thought that was the best advice is that, you know, it's it's okay to make something belong, you know, something yours. Yeah. You, know, it, you, you are unique. Yes. You are, you are unique in the way that you tell your story. Who inspires you? My daughter. Oh, I love that. <laughs> You're going to make me cry again. 
Favourite performance you've ever done? Oh, Favourite would have to be the Sydney Olympics in 2000. That was the closing ceremony, the lead up to it, the performance of it, and then bundled up under a table fast asleep as soon as I came off stage. I was exhausted. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> <laughs> Who's been your favourite interview on your radio show? God, I've had so many. I, I really have had so many. I've, I, I liked Renee Gaya. Ooh. That was really, yeah, she really. Yeah, gave. She, yeah, she really gave. She cried. Yeah. She got tearful. Yeah, she was, she was marvellous. Oh, nice. If you were to study in the future, what would you love to learn? I'd love to learn the field of science and in particular biology, like human and mm. human anatomy, like the bio, something to do with the body. Oh, I like it. Your life wouldn't be the same if? I had no kids. There you have it, the amazing Christine I knew. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Thank you for joining us, Christine. <laughs> it's true, though. It's beautiful. I love it. Thanks for joining me for this episode of the Learning Without Limits podcast series for The Learning Lounge. I'm Melanie Vernicle. Catch you next time. <laughs>